All right, just to give you a little bit of a background on this story. If you were here a few weeks ago, I preached a sermon on, on raising a king. And that sermon was all about Joash and how Joash, because in, in, in chapter 24 in the previous chapter here in 2 Chronicles, we, we see the story of Joash. He was seven years old when he became the king over, uh, over Judah. And um, Jehoiada was the priest at that time, and he helped raise him. And he was doing everything in a righteous and godly way as long as Jehoiada was there with him. But after Jehoiada died, he kind of went down the, the wrong path and was, you know, got into sin. And he actually ended up doing some pretty wicked things and killing some of the priests, killing the son of Jehoiada. Because he, was, he had rebuked him and, you know, and told him that what he was doing was wicked. And for this reason, and this is just to give you the background story of what we're getting into in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. If you want to flip back real briefly to chapter 24, we're going to look at verse number 23. Because as, after Joash did these wicked things, God always brings like a punishment or a judgment upon them. So the judgment that was coming is that he brought the, the Syrians against Judah, against them to battle. So it says in verse 23, And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men. And the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And it's important to notice, like he says, they came with a small company of men. The, the invading army didn't have a, a very large force, especially compared to who they're fighting against in Judah. But see, God is able to you know, lift up and God is able to bring down. And you could win victories with very few men. We see so many great stories and, and, and just uh, inspiring stories of men that did, you know, just like when Jonathan and his armor bearer went over to the Philistines and, you know, and, and they started fighting against them and they turned the whole camp of them away, you know, and, and then all, all the rest of Israel followed. And, and just by using few people, people who just put their faith in God and just trust in God, how they could overcome all of the odds, make all of these great armies just turn around and run because God is with them. Well, God can do the same thing the other way too. When they forsake God, they can, you know, it doesn't matter how many people you have. It doesn't matter how strong your defenses are and how many horses you have and how many you know, soldiers you have to fight. If God's fighting against you, you have no hope. You have no way of winning. That's why it's way more important to be right with God than it is to build up some huge military. That's why I'm not focused even in this country of how big our military is and we need to give more money to the Pentagon and we need to you know, waste more trillions of dollars in, in, in tax money to, to go to build up some great military for our United States because we don't have to have a big military in order to be safe. We need to be fear God and start doing right by Him and rely on God to protect us. We don't need the guns and the, and the armor and the tanks and everything else and the bombs to blow up other countries. We need to be right with God. That's the most important thing. But see, the more wicked a people becomes, the more they think they need to have all this extra armament and, and bombs and everything else because the more people are going to be hating them. And, uh, and, and that's the case, that, and unfortunately, that's the case we're in the United States. I mean, our foreign policy is a joke. We're, we're, we're like an empire going over and, and putting our troops in all these different nations all over the world and sticking our nose in everybody else's business. And the world hates us for it, by and large. But I'm not going to get all political tonight. I just, I'm, I'm actually just trying to give a little bit of backdrop to the story here of what's going on when Joash did wickedly and God fought against them. Verse 25 says, And when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. So he died a disgraceful death. It's real sad because he started off doing really well and then just completely turned against God, turned against Jehoiada, who was his father figure, by killing his son and just acting really wickedly to the point to where he's diseased. His own servants killed him. You know, they just said, you know, we're done with this guy. He brought them in, you know, he brought this, um, the, the wrath of God basically against him through the Syrians. 
The reason why I'm going back to that, turn over to chapter 25 now, we're going to start reading again in verse number 5, is just to show you what's going on. To where we're picking up now in the story because Amaziah now takes over for Joash. Amaziah becomes king in Joash's stead. And this is what he has to deal with now. They're at war with the Syrians. The Syrians had just come in and defeated them. So now Amaziah is planning an attack against Syria. He's planning an attack to, to, you know, to, to win this war, to win this fight, to win back what they've lost. Verse number 5, it says, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together, and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. So he's, he's building up an army. We've got 300,000 men. We're ready to fight. Look at verse 6. It says, He hired also an 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel, for a hundred talents of silver. Now, this is the kingdom of Judah. And if you remember, the kingdom of Israel was split up into two parts. Right after um, Rehoboam, or right after King Solomon, when Rehoboam began to reign, you had, you, had, you had King Saul, you had King David, right? The first kings of Israel. Then you had King Solomon, David's son. And for those three kings, the entire nation of Israel was unified. It was one nation. But because of Solomon's sins, because of all of his wives, and because he turned his heart away from God and, and built up these altars of the false gods, God said, okay, you know what? I'm dividing up this kingdom. And for David's sake, he left them with Judah. He left them with that one portion to be able to rule and reign over. He says, but the rest of it, he's dividing up. So you had the, the bigger nation of Israel and the smaller nation of Judah. And, um, of course, Judah is where Jerusalem is, and that's where... Um, you know, the majority where the, the, the people would go and serve God. And, and anyways, I'm not going to go through the whole history. Read up on that. But what he did here now, they're separated. Amaziah is the king of Judah. He's going to war with Syria. And he has his own 300,000 men, and he hires another 100,000 men. So one-fourth of his entire total army is hired from Israel. Okay, this is what he's planning. You know, he's thinking about this. Well, we're going to go. I'm going to try to get as many people as possible. I'm going to hire troops here so we could go in with 400,000 troops to win this battle. But look at verse number seven. It says, but there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee for the Lord is not with Israel to wit with all the children of Ephraim. So a man of God comes up to him and says, okay, you're going to this fight, you're going into this battle, but you know what? Don't bring Israel with you. Israel's not right with God. At this point, Israel's very wicked. They're, they're, they've turned against God. He's saying, don't get their help. I do not want you to enlist the help of this godless nation. These people have turned their backs on the Lord. Don't, have, don't let them help you at all. Right? This is the message from God. He's saying, don't bring this wickedness with you. Go ahead and fight. He says, but if thou wilt go... Do it. Be strong for the battle. He's saying, but if you're going to disregard what I'm saying, but if you're going to go, go ahead. Be strong for the battle. Do it. But look at what he says. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. And this is what we need to remember in our lives. You know, God has the strength. He has the power to help us. He can be there for us. He also has the power to cast down. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Cost of Doing Right. The Cost of Doing Right. Amaziah hears from the man of God what the right thing is for him to do. The right thing is for him to tell the troops of Israel, say, you know what, you guys got to go home. We don't want you anymore. He already hired them. He already bought the 100,000 troops to go. And you have to remember that when people do this, it's not just a money thing, right? There's, a, there's like a, a pride thing to this. There's also, you know, there's a sense of, oh, what, you don't need our help? You know, the, this, um, there, there's a lot more involved with telling the troops to go home than just a financial thing. Right, than just the money. But one of the things that stands out to him, though, is there is money in this. So Amaziah answers the man of God. Look at verse number 9. It says, And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? 
So he's saying, well, what about all this? I mean, I just spent all this money. I mean, now you want me to just back out? I mean, I just paid all this guys a hundred talents of gold for these, you know, for these troops to help us. That's a lot of money. I can't, I mean, I can't just lightly just, just say, well, whatever, and flush it away. What am I supposed to do about all this? How, I can't get that back. I already hired him. And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Basically he's saying, you know what? Forget about the money. Don't even worry about it. Say, you do what's right. You worry about doing what God has commanded you to do. You don't let them go with you. Hey, the money, God can add that in way more unto you. God can bless you so richly. He's like, don't let that even be a thought. Unfortunately, today, though, in our lives, it is a thought. Unfortunately, when we're deciding what we're going to do, where we're going to live our lives, what, how we're going to lead our lives, the, the, the things that we're going to be involved with, unfortunately, we just think, well, I've got so much invested in this already. I, I, I've already done so much. I've already gotten to this point. I might as well just see it the rest of the way through. And that's not the right thing to do. If we're talking about something that's sinful, if we're talking about something that, that we're doing something that God does not want you to do, it doesn't matter how far along the path you've already made it, when you find out that something is sinful and you find out that something's wrong, you need to be able to say, okay, I'm done with this. I don't care how much money I put into it. I don't care how much effort and time and everything else that's gone into it. I'm going to do what's right. Amen. And it comes at a cost. But you need to be able to not worry, especially when it's financial, forget about it. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Talking about food, talking about clothing, talking about all of your needs and all your necessities and all the things of this world that tend to distract us when it comes to making money and everything else. We don't need to worry about that stuff. We need to be focused first and, and foremost on serving God. He has the power to lift up, and he has the power to cast down. If God's fighting against you, I don't care how much time and energy and work you're putting into anything that you're doing because he could just blow on what you're doing and it's just going to come to nothing. At the same point, if you have all the struggles in the world and all the problems and you're doing right in God's eyes, he has the power to bless and to just and, and to really you know, bless what you're doing and make it fruitful and make it bountiful and make it multiply. Okay? Look at verse number 10. So Amaziah listens to the man of God, and he actually hearkens to him. It says, Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go, to go home again. Wherefore, their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. And don't overlook that. It made him really angry. You're saying, oh, what? What, you think that we're just useless? You know, I mean, think about a soldier and, and their fighting capabilities, and they're thinking that, Oh, you know, at first you thought you needed us. What, you know, what are you saying now? Like that, that you know, he's insulting them based on, you know, that, that they're not good enough for the battle or something like that. You know, he's already paid for them and now he's sending them home. It's an insult. And it made him real angry about it too. And we're going to see, you know, later on at the end of this chapter, they end up, Judah and Israel are fighting with each other. See, here they're hiring them to fight with them, to fight side by side. Later on, they're going to be at war with each other. When you choose to do what's right sometimes, you might end up making people angry. And that's another one of the costs that you might have to face in doing what's right. Amaziah not only had the effect of a financial cost, a financial burden. Hey, we spent 100 talents for these soldiers. You might we just drop, just flush it down the toilet? Yes. Get rid of it. But also, but they're all going to be angry at me and this is going to cause some extra friction. It's going to cause some more problems because these people are going to be angry with me for doing the right thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Let them be angry. If you, if, if you doing what's right is going to make somebody angry, so be it. It's one of the costs. It's important to realize that, hey, it's, you know what? Sometimes people have family members that are unsaved and they don't want to hear the gospel. And it might make them angry if you bring it up to them. But you know the right thing to do is to try to get him saved. It's to preach the gospel to him. And you need to realize, first of all, that there's a cost to doing what's right, but be able to have the strength to still do what's right, to have the faith in God. And no, because you know what? You don't know what the outcome is going to be. Here's, if you don't give a person the gospel, you know what the outcome is going to be. They're not going to get saved. 
Because they need to hear the gospel in order to get saved. If you do preach it, though, you don't know the outcome. You may think you know, but you don't know in the end what's going to happen of that. There are people whose doors I've knocked that I thought, no way in the world is this person ever going to even want to hear anything about Jesus Christ. And those people end up getting saved. And I love when that happens because God's just showing me, like, you don't know anything. You know, this work is way, there's, there's way more things involved here than you realize. Just because a person looks a certain way or is acting a certain way, when you walk up to, I've gone through the ghetto and, and preach the gospel when people have their cars bumping and they're out and they're kind of like gangbanger looking, you know, just, just, just hanging out in front of the, the, the house, maybe drinking some beer or whatever. And you look at these guys and it's like you almost want to just walk away and avoid them. And you go up and you preach the gospel to them and one, you know, and one of them ends up getting saved. Hey, praise God for that, but that's him showing you you don't know the outcome. You don't always know what's going to happen. You just need to do what's right. Just do what the right thing is to do. Don't worry about the results. You know, that's that's going to be handled in another way. We just make, you need to make sure we're doing what God has for us to do. Turn, if you would, please, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is an excellent example of someone in the Bible who had a lot invested in the wrong thing and gave it all up to do what was right. Before the Apostle Paul was the Apostle Paul. His name was Saul. He was a Pharisee. Pharisee Saul. Galatians chapter 1. The Pharisee Saul was excelling greatly in his religion. He was a Pharisee. He was persecuting the church. He was, he was getting the levels within, you know, at, at a younger age. He was a young man, it said. We saw in, this morning when we were in Acts chapter 7, when, the, when Stephen got, got killed, when he was martyred, and Saul was standing there. He was a young man. But he was, I mean, he was on fire for his false religion. He had achieved a lot of accolades. He had achieved a status as a Pharisee. But what was it good for Nothing. I mean, he was completely doing right. He was working against God. He was fighting against God. And see, at the time, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the Bible explains that very clearly. But once he realized the truth, once he got saved, once he realized what he was doing, he had a choice to make. He could do what's right and serve God and, and completely reject everything he's done and, and, and not give it a second thought. Or he can just, you know, he could have gotten saved. And still kind of gone back a little bit to try to, to keep and salvage whatever he could from, from you know, the, the level he had attained. Now, obviously he'd be a hypocrite and, and I don't think God would bless it at all and everything would end up just, just crashing down on him anyways by being disobedient to the Lord. But it's a choice he could have made. Look at Galatians 1 verse 13. The Bible reads, For ye have heard of my, con my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He had a lot of zeal. I mean, he was going forth and really doing something. I mean, he was persecuting the church of God. He was successful in his religion. But look at verse 15. He had no hesitation when he realized he was wrong and what he needed to do. Verse number 15 in Galatians 1. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately... Right away, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. As soon as he found out, as soon as he got saved, as soon as he realized what he was doing was wrong, he says immediately, you know what, I gave all that stuff up. I just, I just said, Forsa forsake it. It's not good. It's not, it's not what he needs to be doing. And started doing what's right. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Just a few more pages to the right. Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Where it sees Paul, so, uh, the Apostle Paul's attitude towards the things that he gave up, towards his life as a Pharisee. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man 
thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I mourn. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He's saying, these are all the things that I was doing as a Pharisee. You, you want to compare, he's like in the flesh, you want to compare yourself to me? I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? And, and, he, and, and he's doing this, you know, obviously he, didn't, he isn't thinking this way about himself. He's just explaining, look, I achieved all this statuses. I, I achieved this level. I was, you know, blameless concerning the righteousness and the law, during zeal. I, I'm out there persecuting church. I did much more than his, you know, than many mine equals. He was doing a lot. But look at what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He says, I suffered the loss. He lost all of that stuff, everything that he had. He suffered the loss of those things. And he says, you know what? I don't even care because I count that like dumb. All the things he accumulated, all his status, all his position, it's like, it, it's like dumb. We need to, do, to have the same type of an attitude when we realize we're, we're doing something wrong. And you know, oftentimes it happens. We can do things ignorantly. You don't know that what you're doing is wrong until it's shown to you, until either it's preached on or you read it for yourself in the Bible, you see God's word somewhere along the way, you see it and you say, wow, I've been doing this for this long, I didn't realize this was a sin, but you have a choice to make. Are you going to just say, you know what, what I've been doing this whole time is done? Can you, can you swallow your pride and have the humility to just say, it was garbage, I was, I, I was deceived. I thought it was the right thing to do, but I realized now it wasn't and be able to just, just toss it to the side and say, okay, well, that was foolish. I'm done with that. I'm going to do what's right now. Or are you going to say, yeah, but I put so much into this. I put so much money in this. I mean, think about a person, and this probably doesn't affect anyone here, but, but imagine someone just spent a whole bunch of money and went through like bartender school, right? I mean, they, they just went through, they did all these classes and stuff, and they just got this new job lined up, and they're making, they're going to be making tons of money. And then they find out, they start reading the Bible, and, and, they, and they hear things preached about alcohol and how wicked it is and how sinful it is and drunkenness, and realize, wait a minute, if I do this, I'm going to be partaking in other people's sins. Wait a minute, if I do this, I'm going to be actually promoting wickedness and, and abomination and, and all kinds of horrible things are going to be happening as a result of me pouring booze for people for them to get drunk. And I'm going to be profiting off that, and you start to realize, wow. I shouldn't be doing this. You have a choice. Well, are you going to... But I, but I paid so much money. I've invested so much in this. Maybe I'll just work until I make my money back and then I'll quit and do what's right. Or can you just say, I'm just going to count, chalk it all up as a loss. Chalk it all up as now I have a lesson learned and I'm going to move forward and do what's right. God has the power to lift up. God has the power to cast down. The right thing to do is to just forsake all that stuff. Be done with it. Say, it doesn't matter how much you've spent to this point. Let go. Be done with it and move forward. Here's another example. And this might hit a little bit more closer to home. I don't think it does in anyone particularly in this church, but, but this hits home with a lot more people than the first example I gave. People who are divorced. This is a big thing these days. You're divorced, you meet someone you really like, you get engaged, you think things are going great, and then you read in your Bible, you start reading, you're in Matthew, right? Maybe, maybe you just get saved, and, and this is the way things are going in your life, you've already been divorced, you get engaged, you're reading in your book, you're reading Matthew, the New Testament, you say, you know, I'm going to read my Bible. You get to verse 31 in Matthew 5, it says, it hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Then you read that and say, whoa, wait a minute. 
Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not reading this right. Maybe I'm not see, maybe, maybe there's something else to this. And you just keep reading, and then you get to Matthew 19. And in Matthew 19, you start reading, and, and you're in verse number 3, and the Bible reads, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, to, and to put her away? And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now you're seeing the same thing again in the same book just chapters later. If you're being honest with yourself, if you're being honest with the Scripture, if you're being honest with just what the Bible says at face value, is there any doubt here what Jesus Christ is teaching about divorce and remarriage? Because I don't think there is. I think the Bible is crystal clear about this. I think the answer is really clear. I just think many people don't want to hear what the Bible says. I think a lot of people, because it's a tough pill to swallow. If you have been married and you've been divorced, it's terrible. I'm sorry. And, and, and it happens, unfortunately, a lot these days. And, and there's nothing joyful about that. And, and it, I don't get any pleasure. You know, I'm not, I'm not just, just railing on people because they're divorced. But if you want to do what's right, if you want to be you know, living a life that is pleasing in God's eyes, if you want to be able to have respect for the Scripture and say, you know what, I've screwed up in the past, I may be on a certain path right now, but I'm going to do what's right, there's a cost associated with doing what's right. Now, I haven't brought this up in the past, and I, and, I, and I probably should have, because I never know what people's situations are or anything anyways. If you've already been divorced, and you've already been remarried, and it's already done, and you're married right now, you know, you stay together with your current wife. That's, you know, God doesn't want you getting divorced again. Okay? And this is not something that, that, that we're, you know, just you know, badgering people about whatever. What we're talking about, though, is just doing what's right according to the Bible, according to Scripture. It's not always easy to make the right choice. Sometimes it can be difficult. D you know, but the Bible says what it says. God was serious when he, when he, when he you know, um, allowed man to become married. And he said, you know, when Adam and Eve became husband and wife, and he says, you know, God has joined them together. You become one flesh. God brought you two together. He's saying what God has brought together, you don't divide that. You don't, you don't split that up. So that's the way that God intended it to be. And if we have respect for God's word, we could, we could read this and say, you know what? This is what it says. You may not like it. You may want to make as many excuses for it as you can. But if you're going to be honest with, you, you know, with, with the scripture, you've got to be honest and take it for what it says and do the right thing. But it could come at a cost. Doing what is right always requires faith. Because you have to trust that what God said is true. You have to be able to trust that, that God is capable of, of blessing and God is capable of cursing. He's able of lifting up and, and bringing down. In the opening example, Amaziah had to trust that God could help him or that God could hurt him based on the decision that he made. He had that faith in it. He had a faith that God was able to do these things. He had to at least have that faith and that understanding, hey, I could have 100,000 more people with me in the battle. Those are, those are pretty good odds. I mean, anyone fighting a battle, of course you'd want to increase your troops by 25%, you know, whatever. You'd want to have that many more people on your side. That's huge. But without the faith in God, he'd make the wrong decision every time. It takes the faith to understand, you know what? This is what God said to do, so I'm just going to listen to what God had for me to do and do it that way. How seriously do you take what's written in the Bible? Do you, do you look at the Bible and just kind of say, well, this is, these are just suggestions and, and a good way for me to lead my life? Or when you read it, do you look at it and say, well, this is what God said, and it's his word and their commandments?
Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 10. It's my last point. It's a shorter sermon tonight. It's a real simple subject. It's a real simple topic. You know, I don't want to belabor the point. There's many, many examples that you could probably think of just in your own personal life where you can see, hey, I've done wrong in all this time. I've done wrong in, 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 in many areas, but I'm going to get right with God now, and I'm just going to forsake. Oh, you know, this isn't even in my notes. But um, while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 10, I'll give you a personal example of, of a cost here that, that happens. You know, the Bible says, the Bible teaches in God's law that um, the man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman, and a woman shall not wear it, put on a man's garments. All that do so are abomination. Okay? In God's eyes, when, you, when, when women wear clothes that pertain to a man and men wear women's clothing, it's an abomination. Now, this subject probably requires an entire sermon in and of itself. And I, and I hate to just touch on things real briefly um, because I like to prove everything I'm talking about in Scripture. But let's just, before I get too deep into this, the Scripture says what it says. So whatever your definition is of a man's garment and a woman's garment, okay, I'm not going to get that far involved in this. But what I believe, and I'll prove this another time, is that if a man is wearing a skirt or a dress, it is a woman's garment, and it's an abomination unto God. It's cross-dressing, okay? I believe that skirts and dresses are clothes specifically for women. And I don't care if... Uh, who, who's, a, who's a common uh, 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 um, designer of clothing? I don't even know, right? Like the last I knew anything about designer clothes was like Tommy Hilfiger or whatever, you know, all, all that old stuff way back in however long ago that was. But if one of the designers comes out, because I mean our size is getting more wicked wicked anyways, and says, you know what, and you know, it probably is out there already, I just don't know, and says, hey, look at this new jean skirt for men. It's fashioned a little bit different. It looks slightly different than the women's skirts do, right? However they do it, maybe they tailor it a little different way. It hangs down a little bit different. But they say, here's a skirt for men. Is that going to cease to be a woman's garment? I don't think so. If I see a guy wearing a skirt, I'm going to be like, that's disgusting. It's going to turn my stomach and say, that's an abomination in God's eyes. Get that skirt off and dress like a man. Or a dress, right? Instead of, instead of it being cut for, for a woman's chest area or whatever, it's cut just more for a man and for his arms and stuff. But he's got these little frills on the bottom and everything else, and he's wearing a dress. Okay, yeah, it, you know, it sounds funny, but I don't think we're that far from this happening. But now, 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 hold on a second, though. Just because some designer says this is for a man doesn't mean it's for a man. That's not how I determine what a man's garment, what a woman's garment is, what this wor wicked world says, and, 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 and where they put clothing in, in, the, in the department store. If those are obviously women's clothing, and I don't think I'd get anyone to, to disagree with me on that issue. Skirts and dresses belong to women. I mean, that, that's, yeah. What is it then that it's a man's garment that a woman shouldn't put on? And ask yourself, that's a rhetorical question. Think about that. Think about what it is. Is it a shirt? I don't think that there are specific things for a shirt that a, that a man can wear, a woman can wear. Is it socks? Is it shoes? I think there's one thing that's obvious. I think it's the universal symbol that they put on restrooms when you understand what is a man and what is a woman. And it's something that any person in any culture in any language can see. Oh, I see two legs here in a body, and I see two feet down here with this little triangle thing going over it for the women. One of the costs for my wife after she got saved and we got married was she had to get rid of her, her pants. Because I, I believe that that is a man's garment. And she had to be shown from Scripture. And again, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit further some other week when, when, when I decide to just kind of preach because there's, there's more Scripture on it. There's more argument. There's more, there's more information that I, that I could give on this subject. Okay. But it comes also down to can we read the Bible plainly and apply it in our lives? And when you hear the Word of God, 
Does it, you know, how does it speak to you? Do you want to make an excuse for it? Do you want to just, just push it to the side? Or are you willing to embrace it? Now look, if you're a woman and you wear pants or whatever, I'm not mad at you. I'm not going to be looking down my nose at you. Okay? Now if you're a man and you're wearing a dress, okay, call, it's a double standard, I know. But I'm going to slap you upside the head. So don't come in here wearing a dress. Okay? But... But seriously, you know, you just have to say to yourself, is this what the Bible teaches? Is this what the Bible says? Okay? And, and do you accept it or not? And that may come at a cost for you. I mean, my wife had some expensive clothing, and we just got rid of it all. Just threw it away. But Hebrews 10 is the last place I'm going to have you turn. Hebrews chapter 10 because maybe there's someone out there that, that's going to hear this sermon online and they live in an area where there's absolutely no decent churches around at all. Or, you know, maybe even someone in this room might find themselves in a similar situation someday. I mean, you're all here right now, but maybe someday some situation will happen and you're, you're off living somewhere else and there's no good churches in your area. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24. The Bible reads, And let us consider one another. Consider each other in the church to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, this is one of the reasons for church is that we come together, we think about each other, we care about each other, and we should be provoking each other to love and to good works. I mean, we're there for you. And, you know, we're here to try to help all of us grow together and you know, talk about soul and get each other fired up, talk about the Bible, talk about all these various things that are going to help you grow as a Christian. The church, everybody, it's not the pastor, it's not just one person, it's everyone together. That's part of the reason why we're here. Look what it says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people, it's their manner to just forsake it. Our assembling, our gathering, our congregating together as a church, as a, as a group of believers. Some people forsake that. It says, as a matter of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That is a strong warning. He's saying, you know, this is talking about willful sin. This is talking about, as would have been the case with Amaziah, willful. He heard from the man of God. He heard from the word of the Lord. Now he's got a choice to make. Are you going to do what's right? Or are you going to willfully say, no, I'm not going to do that. It becomes a much bigger issue. See, sinning ignorantly is one thing. It's still a sin. It's still something that, that is that's considered a sin in God's eyes. But it's different than sinning willfully. It's different than saying, well, now you know the truth. Now you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what the scripture says. And when you still choose to do the wrong thing, be careful, watch out. There's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. God's got the power to lift up. God's got the power to cast down. And, you know, it's not a threat for me. Because I'm not doing any of that, right? This is just a warning. I'm just letting you know. And we're reading it for ourselves in the Bible, like Hebrews chapter 10. A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire and indignation. We don't want God mad at you. Will you do what's right regardless of the cost? Think about Peter and James and John. They gave up their, their livelihood. They gave up their fishing jobs to go follow Jesus. There's a cost involved with doing what's right. Jesus called him and said, hey, follow me. Decision to make. I've worked this hard. I got my own boat. I got my own ship. I got my own company. We're going out. We're getting all these fish. We're doing great. I'm making money. Jesus said, follow me. You're going to listen to him? Or are you going to keep on doing, you know, where your investment is, where your money has been? They made the right choice. They followed Jesus. But think about John the Baptist. We were, we were talking about that this morning. We preach about him this morning. He was thrown in prison and beheaded. He was preaching the word of God. Didn't care about who heard. Didn't, you know, didn't, wasn't a respecter of persons. Didn't matter that it's the, the governor that he's preaching against. Doesn't matter. He's going to preach God's word in, 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 to everybody. And not filter it and not cut it back. He did what was right. It came at a cost. 
Doing what's right will come at a cost. You just have to make sure how you treat God's word and are you willing to pay the cost. And, and honestly, if you're willing to pay the cost, God can give you that and so much more. God can bless it. If you just say, you know what, I'm just done with it. God could bless you so much more for that. Don't, don't get focused on the cost as if it's some huge thing that's lost. Count it but dung like the Apostle Paul did. You can do that. If you don't receive in this world, you'll definitely receive in the world to come. Rewards for, for giving up on all that stuff and suffering loss. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of pr a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for the teaching in the Bible, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to have a, a godly spirit, one that, that is uh, willing and, and receptive to hearing your word, dear God, to, to changing our lives in the areas where we need to change them, dear God, where we could become more in compliance with what, with, um, what the Bible says and uh, with, with your expectations of us, dear Lord. Help us not to cling to any sins in our life. Help us not to, to worry about any costs that might be involved with, uh, with the investments that we've already made up to a certain point in our life and, and with things that are wicked or with things that we shouldn't be doing, dear God. Help us not to be so attached to those things to where we continue doing that which is wrong willfully, dear Lord, but that we can just say, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm just going to do what's right from here on out, dear Lord, and just, just, just stay focused and keep reaching forward, you know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are ahead, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to do this and have the strength to, to do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.